everyone. My name is Andrew Brower. I'm from the University of Michigan, Department of Epidemiology. And today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about multi-state transition models. So the introduction from David this morning um, introduced you to compartmental models. This is another sort of type of compartmental model, um, but we're going to be focused a little bit more on estimation um, and, what, and how that we can connect to data than necessarily kind of coming up with our own assumptions um, and, and kind of understanding how processes move things forward. So what I want to uh, share with you today, um, our learning objectives are to understand why we care about transitions in the context of tobacco control. And we're going to specify, implement, and interpret multi-state transition models to understand longitudinal data of tobacco product use. Um, and in the lab, we're going to graphically summarize transition probabilities and hazard ratios. So I really want to have you get some hands-on experience with actually doing some interpretation and visualization of uh, the results. We're going to apply this really to um, the population assessment of tobacco and health or PATH study, which is an important uh, data set for us in tobacco control. And so let's start with asking why, what are multi-state transition models and why do we want to use them? Um, and so before we get to that, let's take a step back and talk about transitions um, in the first place. And so many of the questions that we have about tobacco use behavior actually do relate to transitions between patterns of use. And so things like initiation, so uh, where we have someone that has a never user of a tobacco product is at some point using a tobacco product. And so we have questions like what groups have the highest tobacco product initiation rates? Do ends or e-cigarettes vaping products are they associated with greater cigarette initiation? Maybe we care about cessation. How durable is short-term discontinuation of tobacco use? When does that turn into longer-term quitting? Does menthol flavoring in cigarettes reduce cessation rates? So these are questions that are you know, currently in front of the Food and Drug Administration. Um, product switching, what characteristics and behaviors are associated with successful switching from cigarettes to ends. So if we think that ends can be a harm reduction product, then how do we get people to actually switch to the harm uh, reduction and not just kind of continue to use both? Um, longitudinal data um, is really important for us to be able to understand transitions because we need to know if someone was in one product uh, behavior and switches to another later but these kinds of data can be difficult to analyze. So if we have a, a longitudinal data set like this, um, I'm saying waves, because that's how path is organized, but it could just be survey one, survey two, survey three. You have the same participants and we have participant one, two, three, four, and so on. And we can see that maybe we have someone that's a never user in all of our surveys, someone that switches from never, and then suddenly they're a non-current user. So we've missed their current use behavior that happened at some point in between uh, survey one and two. Maybe we have someone that, like participant four, was a never user. They never showed up or didn't answer survey two, but came back for survey three, and suddenly they're a non-current user. So we've missed their tobacco product use at some point. Um, and so there's a lot of complexity that we want to try to be able to address. And these can be kind of difficult to do um, with sort of more traditional statistical methods. So the way that we think about this with multi-state transition models is that a person has a true underlying pattern of use. And so at some point they were a never smoker. This is an example trajectory of an individual. They switch sometime between our observations at wave one and two to become a current smoker. They quit uh, at least temporarily between waves two and three, um, but relapse, become a current smoker again by wave four. We don't really observe those specific times of transition. We only observe specific observations. And so what the goal of our multi-state transition model is to estimate these kind of underlying transition rates. And so we're trying to estimate the kind of the pressure or the intensity, the hazard rate um, of transition. And so we might find that there's a fairly low transition from never to current smokers. Um, a moderate um, of that sort of cessation pressure. But if you've recently quit, there's a lot of pressure to 
because of the nicotine addiction, become a current smoker again. And so we want to kind of capture these underlying rates and see how they relate to population level patterns. So our multi-state models are, from a technical perspective, continuous time stochastic models. And in our context, they're going to be tracking individuals' tobacco use state through time. This is a fairly uh, um, flexible model, so it doesn't have to be tobacco use. It can be any number of states. Um, and so like Luzma and I, uh, is, she's working on COPD. And so applying multi-step models to other types of chronic disease, um, infectious disease, other sorts of things. So what you're learning today, transferable. Um, second thing, our transitions can occur at any time, but what's important is that we only observe them at certain times. We're not saying that people can't transition at other times. In fact, we know that they do at any time, but only observe at certain times. Um, and the one big assumption of our approach is that the transition probabilities depend only on the current state and not past states. This is called the Markov property or the memorylessness property. So that in order to make our models um, uh, sort of tractable so that, that we can actually do stuff with them in a way that's mathematically um, uh, easy to work with, we assume that your kind of past history of when you first initiated the defense. Um, I'll just speak louder for now, I guess. Um, and so this lack of history may uh, uh, bias some of our, our results. And so we're really thinking about individuals as making in sort of instantaneous uh, decisions about where they're going um, at their, their the product use. And we care about these transition rates because they're really helpful for our inferences. And so we're able to directly compare things like the transitions between different groups of individuals. And so uh, one of the examples David gave this morning was by age. And so a really important um, differences, especially in initiation, but also in cessation and product switching by age. And so if we look at these two groups, um, we see that um, in group A, our exclusive cigarette users, only 5% go to exclusive ends use. And in group B, it's 9%. Let's assume that these are significant, even though they're fairly close. Um, but the problem is that this probability is easily um, confounded by other sorts of things going on. So underlying this, it may just be that group A is much more likely to switch to non-current use and group B is much less likely to switch to non-current use. This is kind of ex an exaggeration here, but um, in both cases, um, it's 10% uh, of who's left is what's going to the exclusive ends use. And so it really had nothing to do with the difference in that switching probability between the two groups. It was just confounded by a difference in the cessation. So we want to be able to distinguish between um, you know, where the differences between the groups really are. Another useful thing that we can do with these models is compare analogous transitions for pairs of states. And so in this example, we might say, I want to know if the cessation rate for smoking differs if I'm also using an e-cigarette or an end product. And so is that rate from exclusive or cigarette only use to non-current the same as going from dual use of cigarettes and ends to exclusive ends use. And so that, that you know, this is not necessarily causal uh, because the sociodemographics of the dual use population are a little bit different than the cigarette only use, but we can at least look at the association uh, between those. Uh, one thing that David highlighted before is that uh, Modeling is extremely useful for doing things like making predictions and uh, looking at things like counterfactuals. What would have happened if we had made uh, different policy decisions in the past or going forward? And so we might ask questions like, how many people from group C will still be using cigarettes and ends in three years? Or if menthol cigarettes were no longer an option, where would users transition to assuming the rates remain constant? Of course, you have to make assumptions to do these predictions and counterfactuals, 
but you can explore a range of options, kind of sensitivity analysis, um, or make the assumptions that make the most sense. How do we actually start to do this multi-state modeling? So we're going to take into account these multiple competing possibilities. Um, and so in this example, you have somebody that's in a current state, and they have three states they could po possibly switch to, or they can stay in their current state. And look, with some data, we say, OK, it looks like this is a fairly transient state. Only 12% of people are remaining between, let's say, one year. And 2% of them go to state one. 53 to state two, and 33 to state three. And so this allows us to say that we have some idea of the rate of leaving in total, the overall magnitude of that pressure to transition. And we have some sense about how to divvy up that probability between the other transition hazards. And so behind the scenes, we can say, OK, in order to get these numbers, it must be that the total transition hazard or rate per year is 2.16. The numbers are sometimes hard to interpret directly because um, they're not like people per year or something like that. It's an exponential rate. And we can divvy this up between the possible future states. Straightforward when you have one state going to um, three distinct states. The problem is as soon as we start getting into sort of more complicated interconnected networks of states, it's not quite so straightforward. So let's talk about how we develop and interpret this multi-state transition. Maybe I'll stop here for a second to see if there are any questions about introduction. Yeah, Jane. So in the previous slide, you have 0 0.05, 1.3, and 0 0.81. So I don't know if you could elaborate a little more about like, the meaning of a total transition hazard. <coughs> yeah. So the total transition hazard is the uh, sum of those three, at least it should be, hopefully I did my math right. Um, so uh, as we'll see in a little bit, the uh, pressure to transition to each of the three states um, tells us the overall transition uh, uh, pressure to leave this data at all. Um, if you're familiar with the idea of computing blocks, it's, we often think about that each you have kind of these three internal pressures to transition to each of the three. They're all exponential. Um, and so whichever one is the one that goes first is the one that you transition to. It's kind of like which clock is moving the fastest. And, the, and because they're exponential, you have to define the time to first transition. You add up the individual rates. So a little technical maybe, but hopefully. I think what I'm, what I'm maybe not getting is how to interpret 2.16. Um. Yeah. So um, I agree that the rates are hard to interpret in and of themselves. And I think we're going to get to um, a little bit later what the things that we actually want to interpret are. Okay. So these are kind of the un these underlying hazards, but it's, in and of themselves are kind of like, what do I do with this? But what we'll end up doing is manipulating them and say, if this is the true rate, what happens in three years? What's the actual probability of transitioning to some future state? So we'll, let's put a pin in that and we'll come back to it towards the end. Other questions before we move on? Try to figure out how this is. You hear me now? Okay, that's better. Save my voice and your ears. Okay. So we have an underlying sense that there are these rates that we're going to try to capture for kind of pressured into each of our future states. First step in 
specifying our multi-state model is to define the states that we're actually interested in that are individuals that are going to be classified as being in kind of multiple states. In the context of the paper in the reading, um, we looked at both cigarette use and ENDS or e-cigarette use. And in each of them, you could be classified as a never established user. An established user, meaning at some point you had been using and using at enough of a threshold to, to count. Maybe that's 100 cigarettes in a lifetime for cigarettes. And for ENDS use, it was ever fairly regular user. So you can be never established, established, but not currently using, and established and current using. Do this for both cigarettes and ENDS. And so we're going to create this kind of matrix of how we define our states. So someone is a never user if they've not established either. You can have had a couple of cigarettes or you've used tried ENDS, but as long as you're still experimental, we're going to classify you as a never user. Um, if you have used either product but aren't currently using, we're going to call you a non-current user. It's not necessarily the same as former user because in this context, we're using variables of uh, past 30 day. And so past 30 day discontinuation doesn't necessarily mean kind of like longer term quitting. Uh, maybe you're solely using one or the other product. So we have exclusive cigarette users and exclusive ENDS users. But if you're using both, we're going to call you a dual user. There's some subtlety here, so this maybe seem like okay, this is pretty straightforward. But well, how do you define current use? Does it matter how many days a month you're using? Is it just at least one day in the past 30 days? Is it more than 10? Um, does the kind of relative intensity of use of that cigarette versus the ends matter? These are some questions that you'll want to ask yourself as you're developing your own models. And then we have to define what transitions are valid in our model. And so I generally re recommend using a combination of theory or kind of, you know, what you will understand that if you're once a user, you can't go back to being an average user. So it makes sense that those transitions shouldn't be allowed. If you have people in your data that are going from established cigarette use to being never users, that's probably something you want to flag and clean up in your data rather than thinking that that's a model transition that you want to estimate. Um, I also use some statistical estimation. It's a little bit beyond the, the, the sort of technical uh, things that I want to talk about this morning, but happy to chat later after the workshop. So I use Schwartz information criterion, for example, to try to um, shrink the number of parameters in my model. Ultimately, you want the model to be able to estimate all the transitions you put in it. But if it's trying to estimate negligible transitions, um, so maybe in this example, you have exclusive ends use. And do people switch directly from that to exclusive cigarette use? The data suggests probably not. And so if you're trying to estimate that, your model is going to kind of get bogged down with estimating uh, things close to zero. Next, we're going to take our transitions and define an adjacency matrix. So an adjacency matrix is just uh, a matrix that tells us for each of our states labeled one through five, is there a transition between each of those states? So in this example, I'm looking at my never user state and I'm seeing, well, uh, forget about the diagonal for the moment. But the off diagonal elements, the never user can become a non current user. That might seem a little bit strange because the never user has to use at some point. But this is, we have to remember that we're looking at data that are maybe a year apart. And so someone may have experimented in the meantime um, and maybe sort of hit our threshold, but wasn't using by the time we actually got around to interviewing them. And so this is a way of capturing that. And it's something that in, in the paper that you read for this workshop, something that initially we hadn't included, but we found that we couldn't actually fit the data very well without accounting for it. Never users can also initiate to either exclusive cigarette use or exclusive ends use, and those are represented by our colored circles there. And we can do that for each of the others um, in each row is where an arrow starts and the arrow where it goes to 
is where we put a one. And then for some transition rates along our, uh, the off diagonals, we have some transition pressure, a hazard, an intensity, some number. So Jamie, this is where that those 0.53, 1.01, that's where those numbers go in our transition intensity matrix. And then the diagonals, that conversation about competing clocks tells us that the diagonals need to be the sum of the off diagonal elements. If this is too much sort of technical information, let it wash over you. We'll do it a little bit in the lab, but it's something we can, can come back to. This Q matrix is how we're going to get to an interp uh, interpretive um, object and connect the data. And we do this through what's called a matrix exponential, and it turns these rates into probabilities. Again, we're not going to get too much into the technical details at the moment, but the idea is we're taking these rates and we're turning them into probabilities. And these probabilities can then connect to the data through a statistical likelihood. And again, technical details aside, the general idea here is that we have some rate parameters that are kind of our underlying um, inputs. We have some function that takes those and matches how well they fit the data. So our rate parameters tell us how they fit the data. Um, David was doing very, something very similar this morning, um, trying to figure out what cessation rates for smokers give us the smoking prevalence that best fits that NHIS data. Then you might say, okay, I have my basic model structure, but not there's these heterogeneities that we want to account for in the population. Um, maybe we're not going to go so far as an individual based model, but we still want to account for things like age because young uh, adults versus older adults have very different transition rates, um, both in terms of initiation, but also cessation, product switching, willingness to be interested in trying ends, so on and so forth. So you might in include things like age, uh, gender, race, ethnicity, um, socioeconomic status, um, education, income. Maybe you're interested in behavior. So if that cigarette that they're using is menthol flavored, if their ends product is a sweet flavor, is it a menthol flavor? Is it unflavored? How often are they using? Are they using more than 10 days? Are they using more than 20 days in a month? Um, but maybe there are other measures that, that could potentially be explored, things like dependence measures or biomarkers. And so that there's a lot of kind of opportunity here to think about how these things that we measure in the data impact likelihood to transition. Okay, so how do we do this? So um, the MSM package, it's highly recommended. This is in R if you're uh, working with R. Um, and it's gonna do mostly what you need is you have an unweighted data set, it's great. Um, but if you have a weighted data set like path, um, I've developed some code in our weighted MSM function, MSM for multi-state transition model, um, which is also available in R and what we're gonna be using in the lab was developed to handle these participant weights. Um, it's not necessarily quite as uh, robust as the original, um, but it works pretty well for now. So it comes with the work example that we're kind of gonna go through in the lab um, and I periodically update it. So, Multi-state transition models um, are great in, in many respects, but there are some limitations that we want to be aware of, and there are some things that we might need to work around. So the first I mentioned this Markov assumption. So uh, the transition rates um, that we're estimating are we're assuming that they depend only on an individual's current state and not their full history. Um, but in truth, we know that at least to some extent, full history and the time that they're currently in their state is likely to be relevant. So if someone has quit for 25 years, they're probably not as likely to relapse as someone that's been quit for five months. And so maybe that's something that we want to take into account. If you have information about um, length of time and state, 
then that could be included, for example, as a covariate. And so that might be one workaround if you think that your assumptions are being violated by the data. There's also the issue of rates can change over time. This is very true for uh, you know, currently in tobacco control, where the marketplace is really changing very quickly with uh, e-cigarettes and other vaping products, um, nicotine pouches, and, and probably other things that are gonna be introduced over the next couple of years. Likely that means that's going to impact how people transition between different products. And we need to be able to account for that. Of course, if we just kind of slap our model on the data, it's assuming that there's this homogeneity of our rates over time. And so either we need to do something like incorporate time or year as a covariate, or we'll have to estimate our transitions in kind of blocks, blocks of time. So you do up through 2017, then you do up to 2020 when COVID starts, that's you have your COVID years, your post COVID years and so on and so forth. So this is getting more to Jamie's question. Um, so what do we do with the results of our model? So the, these hazard rates are useful because we can do lots of things with them, but they don't directly um, are not useful for interpretation. And so one really straightforward thing to do is to convert those rates into cumulative transition probabilities. And so to say, okay, given the rates that I've estimated, how is one going to transition within one year? And so one thing that I like to do is make these heat maps of transition probabilities. So if I look across a row, I can see the probability of transitioning to each other state. So those never users, 96.6% of them were estimating are going to stay never users within one year. 2% will transition, will have experimented, hit that 100 cigarette um, mark, but stopped within one year. It could also be that they were not really being truthful about being never users to begin with. Um, that's a thing I suspect in PATH, but um, something to keep in mind. But we'll see that 1% or, th or thereabouts are transitioning to cigarette only use and only 03 to exclusive ends use. Of course, this was 2013 to 2017, I think. And so um, a certain snapshot of time um, pre jewel largely. And so what happens after um, is a good question. You might also look at our, our exclusive cigarette users. 85% um, of them, these are adults, also 18 to 90. Um, over that large age group, the average is that about 85% of the cigarette users are gonna stay cigarette users, that, that diagonal element. But if we compare that to the ENDS user, it's a lot, the ENDS user is a lot more transient. So only about um, 57, around 60% are staying ENDS users. But Keep in mind, there's also the dual users. And so the dual users are also using e-cigarettes. So this ends up being around 70%, I think, of exclusive ends users staying ends users of some type, but maybe some of them are going back to also being cigarette users. And so we can, we can try to uh, interpret the elements of our probability matrix. We'll go into this a little bit more detail towards the end of this hour. And, and we can also adjust this to look at longer periods of time. So maybe we don't care about one year. Maybe we care about six months. Maybe we care about two years, four years, 10 years. Of course, the longer that you try to forecast, the less reliable you're going to be because sort of small errors propagate, but also over time, the rates are changing. And so, by, by setting that um, our current rates and saying and projecting them to the future, we're saying they're not changing. Well, we could also make assumptions about how they're changing um, and kind of go from there. So as you can see, modeling, you know, some of it's just sort of straightforward sort of mathematics and statistics, but a lot of it is assumptions and applying those, understanding them and applying them in smart ways.
we might also be interested in our hazard ratios. So these are how much more, how or what, how much more pressure to transition is one group feeling than another. And one way I like to do this is to look at forest plots. Um, so along the sort of hazard ratio of one, we have a dotted line. That means no difference between the two groups in their hazard rate, their intensity to transition. Um, uh, the way that um, I like to plot this on a log scale is because these ratios, you know, one half is equivalent to two in how different you are between the two groups. Um, and the confidence intervals here, if they don't touch one, that means they're statistically significant. You can do fancy things like color them by whether they're statistically significant or not, um, kind of depending on, you know, your mood and your visualization preferences. So here um, we could look at, for example, hazard ratios for each transition. This is the sort of exclusive cigarette to dual use. So cigarette users who are taking up e-cigarettes. And we see that no difference really between uh, men and women. But there's a pretty big sort of racial ethnic difference here where white cigarette users are much more likely to pick up ends than the non-Hispanic, Black, and Hispanic users in this population. Um, if we look at age, huge age gradient we see um, with that, those 18 to 24s being almost five times the rate, having five times the rate of transitioning, picking up ends than the 55 plus users. And it kind of decreases from there as you, you grow up more. But even the 35 to 54 year olds are about twice, have twice the rate of the 55 plus. Some of these others not quite reach, reaching statistical significance in terms of education or income, but those might be uh, relevant for other transitions like cigarette initiation. So um, I've gone through this somewhat quickly. Um, there's still a little bit more, but uh, have some references here if you are interested in learning more about uh, the underlying uh, statistics and, and mathematics. I recommend the Essentials of Statistic Processes. If you're interested in multi-state modeling and its implementation specifically, um, Chris Jackson's multi-state modeling with R, the MSM package. Even if you end up using the weighted MSM package, it's a very useful um, tool for understanding kind of what, what we're doing and why. And of course, this is um, the example that we're going through today, both here in lecture and in lab. It's a good place for me to pause though, to see if there are more questions. If not, let's talk through some of the examples in this paper. So this is our example. Again, this is the population assessment of tobacco and health or PATH study. Um, published a couple of years ago. And if you're not familiar with PATH, PATH is a long running longitudinal study of tobacco use. I guess I should say long running starting in 2013. So it's been going for um, the better part of a decade at this point. Um, in this example, we have about 23,000 adult participants. So it's a really nice large data set. It's weighted to be nationally representative and uh, this is done in, uh, has a complex survey design. So not only is it weighted, it has these um, sort of complex approaches. Um, so those of you who have worked with things like um, stratum and PSUs, we're not gonna work with those directly. And instead we're gonna use something called replicate weights, um, which can be used to do variance calculations. So the problem, if you don't take into account complex survey design, your uh, things like clustering of individuals and geographically, because you know one locale may just have a much higher smoking prevalence than another. If you're not kind of accounting for that clustering, um, that can be a problem, and you're going to have bias in your uh, variance estimates. Um, the covariance of interest that we're going to use: age, 
Um, I've wrote, written sex here, but really it's gender um, because it's self-identified um, uh, gender, race and ethnicity, um, which I'm combining here um, to uh, include both um, white, black, and other, but also Hispanic ethnicity and kind of crossing them to get non-Hispanic, black, non-Hispanic, white, Hispanic, and other. Also some information about education, income, and we're going to define our states like we did earlier in the presentation based on established use of both cigarettes and ends and current past 30 day use. And we're gonna make the, de the decision here that any past 30 day use counts as use, even if it's a single day. Um, looking at, and so one thing that's really helpful to, to think about, though I haven't put it in the presentation, is look at distributions of use patterns to say, are there useful um, cutoffs, for example, where uh, I want at least 50% of uh, people to be in different groups, so low intensity or high intensity group. And what turns out for both actually cigarette and ends use is that the vast majority of people are using 30 out of the past 30 days. So coming back to our tobacco use states, we saw these before, our never established, our non-current users, our sole cigarette users, our sole ends users, and our dual users of both products. Um, and we have the transitions we looked at before. And the first thing that we're gonna do is just confirm that our model is actually fitting the data well. Because of course you can have a model and you're like, okay, great, I've estimated these transition rates. Here's the probability of going forward. Well, if you haven't actually checked to see if you've done a good job of fitting the data, your estimates might not be kind of really useful. And so here on the left, we have our empirical one-way cumulative transition probabilities averaged over five, uh, four ways of path. And on the right, we have our modeled uh, cumulative transition probabilities. And as you can see here, uh, they're not 100% perfect, but they're quite close. And you might say, okay, well, then why do I even care about these transition probabilities, right? Because like, I can just look at the data to get the transition probabilities. What is the model doing for me? Well, again, the model uh, is allowing us to now take those underlying estimates, understand them as um, sort of uh, pull, pull them apart from the transition probabilities to understand whether you know the this rate here is different for different ages, whether um, the probabilities are confounded by two competing rates, how do we do forecasting? And so the next step, um, we'll come, come back to this. Forecasting, the data can't do forecasting because it's the true data. We need some way of moving that, what, what we are seeing currently and move that forward. And so if we do look at two years into the future and four years into the future, um, where do we expect most, uh, uh, current users to be. And so we can see that maybe we don't want to kind of push this too far because um, here everyone's kind of either, um, uh, most people are kind of moving to current cigarette use based on how ENDS use was prior to 2017. It's assuming people are trying e-cigarettes and quitting them. And so eventually most people are going to quit them. And we don't want to take that too far forward because Juul, started in late 2017, a lot of other pod-based disposables over the next couple of years. And so this is probably not really um, that accurate, but it's something that the data can't do, but the model can. I just want to note, we saw this before, again, exclusive cigarette use, really uh, a persistent uh, state, um, either as exclusive or as in dual use, where that ends is a lot less um, persistent. Still 70% of users maintaining that pattern, but many of them also going back to exclusive cigarette use here. So this 
we can also look at these transition hazard ratios. So comparing analogous transitions based on their current state. So there are three states here, never use, non-current use, and exclusive ends use, which could all initiate smoking um, or relapse that smoking use. And the question is, how do the rates compare based on which of these three states you're in? So compared to the rate of never users initiating for the first time, the rate of non-current users relapsing to exclusive cigarette use is five times that. So, and that makes sense, right? Um, we'd expect people who are former users um, or, or uh, at least past users to kind of to, to come back to that cigarette use at a high, a faster rate than or greater rate than the never users. And the question is, well, how does that compare to exclusive ENDS users? So if you're currently using an ENDS product, what's the likelihood you become a dual user? So that's just adding that cigarette state. It turns out that it's about 25 times that of the never user, about five times that of the non-current user. Okay, so, but we have to be a little bit careful here because I'm not saying that ENDS use is a catalyst to smoking because uh, these associations are not causal. The demographics of the non-current user is much, much different than that of the exclusive ENDS user. And so it's not saying that the ENDS user who has never smoked, because most of the people who are exclusive ENDS users are previous smokers, the vast majority of them are. And so um, we have to be, um, we don't wanna over-interpret these hazard ratios. Their associations, not causal. Okay, so that was initiation of cigarettes. Well, a big question is, are ENDS helping people quit? So we can compare how the rate of exclusive cigarette users going to non-current use compared to dual users going to ENDS only use. And we find that the hazard rate is about around two. So dual users have a rate of about twice that of sole cigarette users in, in cigarette, um, cigarette cessation. Again, not causal because the profiles of dual users, a lot younger, generally speaking, than the exclusive cigarette user and young, uh, younger adults have higher transition rates across the board. And so this is not necessarily causal, but again, an association. These forest plots that we did, we can do them sort of across all of the transitions. Um, you can look at the paper to kind of get into this in a little bit more detail, just kind of put this up here as a gestalt of what things look like. For never to cigarette users, we can see a lot of things are, a lot of our sociodemographics are very significant. Um, including that education and income that we saw was not for ENDS initiation, or excuse me, um, the cigarette to dual state. Um, it's useful to be able to look at how these, these sociodemographics impact the transition rates. Okay, but it's not always easy to sort of translate these and interpret them. So I kind of also like to go back and take these probabilities by uh, individual groups. So now we can look and compare the transition probabilities by age and by, uh, so the, the younger adults and the older adults, because I can look and say, okay, I can look at the hazard ratio for never to cigarette use, for never to ends use, and I can, I have all of these transition hazard ratios, but how do they kind of interact, right? To actually create the, the true prob the probabilities because you could say like, okay, well, maybe this hazard ratio is really high, but the underlying hazard for the, um, the referent group is low. And so it's really not making that much difference when the, this competing rate is really high. And so the probability isn't gonna be that different. And so we really, it's nice to be able to come back and look at the individual uh, probabilities. And we can see as a whole, the young people have a lot sort of like less intense color here, right? The probability, of um, remaining is lower for the younger adults compared to the older adults. 
Um, so what else am I say? So in this example, we found that uh, ENDS use in this very specific time period was more transient than cigarette use um, with about 90% of cigarette users and 86% of dual users continuing to use cigarettes after a single wave or about a year. Um, with only 70% of ENDS users and 50% of dual users continuing to use ENDS. So in this time period, a lot of adults were trying ENDS, but not really continuing with them. And so we might wanna be interested in why that's the case. This time period was um, the, the sort of ENDS were um, still kind of developing. Uh, maybe they were using free base nicotine and not nicotine salts that um, Juul uh, and, and others sort of re really ran with, which are a lot less harsh. And so if you have these kind of harsh ENDS products, um, not, not as pleasant. Um, but we did find that ENDS use was associated, not necessarily causally, but associated with a much greater rate of starting cigarette use, particularly versus never users, um, which could potentially be a, a, cat, a um, catalyst for smoking cessation, but is kind of probably more likely um, among this group um, sort of continued nicotine addiction in a, a former cigarette user group. So that's how I, how I think about this. Um, but we also see a greater rate of stopping cigarette use. Um, again, that's probably confounded by sociodemographics. Um, something else I wanted to say about that. What was it? It comes to me. Um, so a couple of big picture takeaways from this hour are um, these multi-state transition models are just, they're one way of approaching uh, this kind of longitudinal tobacco product use states, and they have a number of nice advantages. So we can account for multiple competing transitions. If you just have a single transition, you don't really need sort of the complex machinery here, but we need to be able to holistically account for lots of different things that a person can do and might have done between the times that we surveyed them. If we would just look at the data, we can say, okay, sure, we can. We saw the transition probabilities, um, the, the empirical things, they're really helpful, but they can't do necessarily predictions and ask kind of what if scenarios, where are things going in the future? What would have happened under other circumstances? And we can more directly compare transitions across different types of user sociodemographic groups. And this is important because the empirical probabilities can't really tell us this because the probabilities are inherently confounded by the competing, um, the competing rates. Um, so I have a couple of minutes left for questions. So I just wanna thank um, everybody that was really involved in the work, um, both from our center and our federal partners um, funded by NCI and FDA. And I'll pause here and see if there are questions. Anyway. Uh, so, you know, when you're comparing groups and you're looking at, you know, these, uh, this huge map, um, you know, a lot of it, maybe when you're eyeballing and looking at differences in, in the shade of red or the shade of orange and sort of, uh, sort of high level differences, but is there a, a way to kind of quantify differences? Absolutely. So these actually all have variances. They all have confidence intervals. Um, and so we can do our normal statistical tests to say, um, is there a statistical difference in the, in the probabilities? I just find that kind of gets kind of busy um, to, by putting them up on there, but we can do all of our sort of normal statistics. Um, that's part of the reason that we needed the weights to be able to get our variances correct for path. Um, but just as the hazard ratios all have confidence intervals, so too do our probabilities. Okay, but I think those are like individual, individual. So what, what is it that you'd like to, to do, for example? I, I guess like if you were looking at, at like all of these possible transitions at once, kind of. Oh, so like as a whole, are the transitions for young people different from old people? Right. Yeah, interesting. Um, so certainly you could say like 
if any single one is different, then the whole thing is different. Um, I, I'm also thinking you could do kind of like chi squared um, on the whole probability distribution. Um, Similar enough that it doesn't make sense. Absolutely. Yep. So, um, question is, you know, when do you want to aggregate groups? When do you want to disaggregate groups? I would say that this is kind of an iterative process. So, um, I always make the mistake of not following my own advice to keep it simple, stupid, um, and try to do the most complex thing because I think it's all always you know, really useful to, to get all that kind of detail. But then the model doesn't really work and it's not converging. And so then you're like, okay, right. I was supposed to keep it simple. Start over with the full population and then kind of break it down from there. See where I'm seeing important differences um, and, and kind of go. I you know, don't think of it like p-hacking. We're not trying to just find you know, where the, the, the useful or where the significant things are, we're trying to figure out, um, you know, what we have power to detect, and where the useful distinctions are. That's how I think about it. There are questions. Yep. Maybe a um, multivariate regression kind of perspective, but when we are comparing the um, transmission rates. Um, how meaningful is um, controlling that, like the possible founder? Like, yeah, good question. So, um, how do we? Let's even just let's say like, what's the difference between a univariable model accounting for one covariate versus a multivariable model accounting accounting for multiple covariates? So, a lot of that comes in at this point, where we say, okay. Um, we see that like, um, you know, there's a higher uh, rate for non-Hispanic black versus non-Hispanic white, but they have a different age distribution. And so some of that higher rate is actually just because it's a slightly skewed younger population. And so we'd wanna account for that um, in our, our rates. So it is very useful to think about how a multivariable model is going to Kind of get these a little bit adjusted for um, sort of distributions of potential confounders. So, so that is something I will sort of warn that these models run slowly the more variables we want to stick into them. And so we have to be careful. So I always say keep it simple to begin with, run your univariable models, and then move forward. One thing I will note is that. Multivariable models don't really help us understand these probabilities because it, it's not clear how you adjust in the, the probability sense, right? It's um, because these probabilities are for this population as it looks like in, in your data set. And so, yes, the probabilities might be different if there's kind of a different sort of income distribution, which there probably is between these age groups. But what is it even meaningful to try to unadjust for income and say like, okay, well, in a different world where 18 to 24 year olds have the same income distribution as 55 year olds, what would the probabilities look like? I'm not sure it's a useful question. So I often think about these probability, the probabilities in terms of univariable, and I like to adjust the hazard ratios for our potential confounders. It's a great question. Yeah, Jihan. So thanks a lot. But this is really a great like thorough review of the best of the methods. So what would have been interesting computation rates along the way of your own like initial experience and suspicion of the Absolutely, great question. Um, we'll see a little bit of so the question was how computationally intensive is this? Um, and we'll see a little bit about that in the lab in 15 minutes. Um, but it really depends on the data, depends on your model, depends on how many covariates you include. So if, you, if the model is pretty straightforward, it can run in 
30 seconds to a minute. If you have a really large data set and you're trying to um, have like multiple levels of a covariate, we're talking days. For a full multivariable model, we could be looking at weeks. Um, and so that's another reason if, if, you're, if you're committing to large computational products, uh, projects, really good to make sure you know what you're doing with your base model and your univariable models to make sure everything's looking like it's running right. You don't have any convergence issues before you sort of set into a larger project. Thank you. So it looks like this is a good place to have our break. We'll come back. Um, I'll talk through the lab and sort of set you to, to work through that. So this will break. I don't know if Luzma or anyone has anything to say or we'll just stop here.